We are back with another episode of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. It is, what day is it? Wednesday. We're recording November 30th. Uh, what day is it, Troy? Where are we? Who are we? What's happening? I think it's Wednesday. I got all messed up because our game for high school yesterday got canceled, or not canceled, postponed, because we had a little snow issue, which this game would have never been canceled when I was a kid, so I'm going to be the old grumpy man right now, but it is what it is. Minnesotans going soft, Troy. That's they are. We about. are going soft. This one be this one be canceled in Canada for six inches of snow. Forget that. What a gong show, though, today has been. We got to regroup now for the podcast. So we've had winter storm driving. You know how dependent I am on our show notes, and I still can't print the first two pages. So I got to take deep breaths here and get through this first part of the show without show notes. It's going to be tough. We what else is? Oh, we've yeah, we've had snowstorm. It's cancellations, postponements, but we're here. We got a lot to talk about and excited to do that. Before we get started, though, I need to remind everyone that the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a Patreon podcast. What that means is that we rely on your support to help us continue to produce the show, hopefully produce better and more content for you, and do our own little small part to grow the hockey hobby. It's very easy to support us. All you have to do is go to the Patreon website, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com, search for Hockey Cards Gong Show, and you'll see our out of 99 support tier level, which is $5 a month. And like I said, helps us help support the show. Also gets you access to the Hockey Cards Gong Show Discord server where you can join our community. You'll get the out of 99 title while those last and forever have that and our gratitude. Other ways you can contribute by Patreon is you can visit the link in the show description, or you can go to our Instagram profile page, and there's a link in our link tree to do that. With that being said, Troy, why don't you run through the game plan? Sure. On today's show, we begin with the most famous NHL player to wear number 36. Hold on to your hats. It's it's an exciting one. I know a lot of people are waiting for this one. Then we take a quick look at an interesting article around peak player ages, Then we look at Movers and Shakers, followed by a look at the current auctions at PWCC and some of the interesting cards we noticed up for sale. Then it's off to Hobby News, followed by a look at Jason Robinson versus Kirill Kaprizov, doing a little comparison. And then we end the show with new product releases and our listener mailbag. All right, I've given enough preview. I talked about it last week. The end of our streak of goalies is hit. Plus our end of, I think, <laughs> truly legendary legendary players has come to an end on famous players to wear the jersey number that matches our episode number. I don't want any hate mail. I apologize if this is your favorite player in the world. But number thir- 36, the most famous player to wear number 36 is Matthew Barnaby. All right. Boom, boom. Yeah. Matthew Barnaby. Obviously not in the ca- same caliber as a lot of the – players we've talked about however hey he's got number 36 on lockdown so good for him so he was a right winger during his career he played 834 regular season games over a 14 year nhl career he's kind of got a potpourri of where he played at he played seven years with buffalo three years with pittsburgh three years with the rangers two years with tampa bay one year with colorado one year with chicago and one year with dallas obviously if you add those up they're more than 14 He's got some half seasons with a couple teams because he got traded or signed and released and fun stuff like that. How many teams did he play for? So it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven teams. Oh, wow. A lot of teams he played for. Yep, journeyman, definitely. All right, awards and accomplishments. No Stanley Cups and no individual hardware for Matthew Barnaby. However, Impressive. Yeah, however, he did have 2,562 penalty minutes which puts him 18th all time. Twice he led the league with most games played in the regular season with 82 games each season. And then he led the league in penalty minutes twice and was in the top 10 for penalty minutes seven of his 14 seasons. He had a career regular season stat line of 113 goals, 187 187 assists for a total of 300 points. 
He made the playoffs in seven of his 14 years in the NHL with 62 games played, seven goals, 15 assists, and 22 points. So Barnaby, basically I remember this guy, and what I read about him was exactly what I remember. He was considered a pest, an agitator during his career, and was frequently involved in on-ice altercations. And then I just I just stole this next line right from Wikipedia. He made headlines in 1996 when an in-game brawl against the Philadelphia Flyers after a few hits and Barnaby laying on the ice presumably injured. A brawl between the two teams started. With the brawl in full motion, Barnaby jumped to his skates to, to go after Gar Snow, goaltender of the Flyers, who was poking Barnaby with a stick while the officials weren't looking. To me, just the the image of this is just hilarious. And I, I wish someone would do this at soccer games because I've been watching some World Cup. And when those guys fall, like they've been shot after they've been touched on the shoulder by a hand, I would love it if someone just went over there and started kind of kicking them with their foot or poking them to see if they're okay. <laughs> it's so, so just, ridiculous when that happens in soccer. What's yeah. the website that you always go to for hockey fights? It's just just Google hockey fights, and it's the first one. I think it's hockeyfights.com, actually. Uh, I'll have to look that one up with uh, Hextall because I'm no, sure it's that's... Uh, Gar Snow. Gar Snow. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, <laughs> just it's the, the the description just is great. Just poking poking him with the stick. All right. So Barnaby, his actually his career did end. He had lingering effects from concussions, which kind of forced the end of his career. After his career, he, obviously, he did some TV work. He also did some coaching. He's also had some illegal issues after his career's over. We're not going to get into them. You can find all that if you look it up. So a fun fact about him, he currently, guess what, hosts a podcast called no. Unfiltered with Matthew Barnaby. So he's a competitor, direct competitor of us. Obviously, he's not talking well, about hockey him cards. forget him then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's not talking about hockey cards, but... So that's that's his little fun fact. All right, now we get into the just here's the truly depressing stuff. His rookie card, 1992-93 Parkhurst, number 483. There are no PSA graded copies in the PSA database. In fact, PSA only shows nine graded cards of Matthew Data well, Matthew Barnaby in their database. If someone see, <laughs> finds that different, please let me know. That's what I found. Beckett does have two graded copies Ooh. of the 92-93 Parkhurst number 483, but this is the Emerald Ice variant. So they have a BGS 9 and a BGS 7.5. And Beckett only shows 14 graded cards of Matthew Barnaby in their database. So, so Beckett we, has fancy Barnaby, which is going to yeah, cost you the yep. big dough. Yep, so 23 total graded cards between the two, between Beckett and PSA. So that, did you look a, at how many sales there are for him and Card Ladder? I didn't. I I actually did look. I mean, there's Barnaby cards out there. Um, a lot of it, I didn't look at the exact number of how many sales, but I did look at this. So using Card Ladder sales history, the highest sale of any card in their database for Matthew Barnaby is a 2018-19 Upper Deck Chronology Letterman Auto Signatures out of 20. Four, and then I put, I was going to play a trivia game, but you might be looking it up right now. Do you know how no, much I'm it not. went for? No, I'm not. We can do a trivia game. Yep. How much did it go for? The highest Matthew Barnaby sale in Card Ladder? $43. Boy, <laughs> boy, reverse them. Or if you're dyslexic, $34. Wow. $34. So that, was, that was the highest I could find in Card Ladder's database. So obviously, we do not have to go run down his PSA 10, 9 rookie cards and all that stuff. <laughs> So just know his highest sale in the in the card layer database was thirty four bucks or thirty four US dollars. So kind of a short one, kind of a quick one today. Um, I think the next couple for sure next week will probably be another similar kind of thing. If I remember, okay. So right. there is sixty four card sales in card ladders sales history, and one of them is a game used jersey. So I don't know how that happens, but yeah. Not a lot of hobby steam. Nope, okay, I've got a really steam. important question for you. Okay. If you were Connor Bedard and you got drafted and said, hey, I want number 36, what are the odds that by next year when the <laughs> hockey writers rewrite this article that he's the greatest number 36? Yeah, he might be. If he has a, a stellar year, and can, I mean, just think about it. If 
Now, this is way hyperbole, but say he comes in and has 80 to 100 points. I mean, maybe he becomes the greatest player to wear number 36. That's kind of funny. And I lied. Number 37 is actually a decent player. So, okay. And then I have another important question. So I know that the hockey writers give, like, alternate selections, like runners-up. Yes. Up. yes. Who the heck was the runner-up for? All right, runners-up. Our guy, Matt Zuccarello, was a runner-up. Zook. And UC Jokinen was the other runner-up. Oh, Zuccarello's not better than Barnaby? Not according to this article. Oh, man. Maybe maybe now. I don't know. That hurts my I mean, feelings. Barnaby did play 14 years. I mean, he had, he a, he had a role, and he had he, he played did. it well. I mean, I would like, I'm glad the, the Wild got Reeves, but it would be nice to have Barnaby on our team to protect Caprice off when he gets mugged and, you know. And, and why don't hockey players like the number 36? Is there something I don't know here? or I don't know. I don't think so. Oh, okay. I don't, I, never, I don't know if there's any superstition around it or anything. We should do a months-long study on the <laughs> reason why NHL players hate the number 36. So, yeah, so. no kidding. All right, so that was that. So I, think, I guess we're just going to keep rolling. I'm going to take over the show. It's, probably it's the, the longest, Troy show today. It's probably the longest I've ever talked in succession. So, uh, Is your mouth fired? I need a drink. But I was going to say, if you, go, if you don't like my voice or you don't like me, you're, you're in for trouble now. Well, I've got just... a glass of wine here, so I'm just going <laughs> to sip on my wine while you do the show. This is kind of fun. Nice. All right, so the next subject I don't want to get into. There was an article recently. It was in the uh, – no, it was, on a, it was a Twitter by Micah Blake McCurdy. If you don't know who he is, he's an awesome – and that he does a lot of analysis on hockey and other things, but he's a mathematician. He's a teacher, but he did a very interesting analysis around skill specific aging curves. And the reason I actually brought this up is we talk about prime ages a lot. Like, Oh, they're entering their prime years, 27, 28. Well, this is a study that kind of looks at these age curves and it's pretty, it's actually pretty fascinating. So the research was published on, Hockey Viz is the website. I'll try to put a link in our show notes. So if anyone wants to read it, he also has a Twitter account. It's called Ineffective Math. And just to give a little background on McCurdy, um, in, in his research, he states, I became a mathematician and a teacher because I feel that if you figure something out, you should tell everybody who is interested, which is why am I a bad, which is why I am a bad fit for NHL team employment. This is one guy that's been – the NHL teams have been trying to hire him forever, and he won't because he always says, yes, I'll work for you, but I will share all my research. And no oh. team no team will want to give that up. Like, they, that's proprietary. They want to keep it. They want to be secretive. Yep, and he does – all this stuff is published on his website. It's all free to look at. It's awesome. And just to give a little bit of – a more little heads up, this research is very in-depth, a lot of great information and data modeling – I won't do it justice by giving you a five-minute overview, but I just want to give a quick overview of it and why it's important for hockey players and maybe in turn help your thinking about hockey cards and maybe when players are reaching their peak. Because if you look at what the research and the data is showing for when players hit their peak on specific skills, our assumption has always been the players hit their prime at age 28. I think I've heard that for 20 years. And when you look at hockey players, that might not be the answer. That's probably not true. So the most important finding, if you take away anything, the most important finding in the research is that different abilities have quite different peak ages. Offensive impact peaks around the age of 23, which I had to read that a couple times. To me, that is just, that kind of blew my mind. And when we say offensive impact, it means the offensive impact on expected goals per 60 minutes. Again, I'm not going to get into the math. Go read the paper. He lays it all out. <laughs> it's, it's very in-depth. So you know why that instantly makes me sad? Guess. Capri's off. <laughs> yeah. Older than 23. We came yep. into the league older than, like, what? Yep. Or he was 23. Or yep. And our now, whole this, assumption this, was Yeah, but remember, that... this isn't every player, right? It's just it's a data set, right? A cohort. You got all these players some are going to be on one side some on the other but sure more than likely it, it peaks around age 23 with defensive impact at five on five peaking two years later at 25 
I always thought that was kind of interesting too, but it falls off more slowly than offensive impact. So it's like offensive impact peaks, and you'll see the charts if you look at this paper, peaks at 23 and then starts falling off at a more steep level than defensive impact. Yeah, you showed me the chart. It was alarming, and I recommend yep. anyone go check it out. I also wonder if this will tie into sort of that magic 19 age that we've been talking mm-hmm. about where we're starting to see players start to play full season or skaters play full seasons at the age of 19. If there's going to be more and more of a push to get these guys into the league earlier, mm-hmm. if their peak is earlier, right? You want to, yeah. uh, you know, so if the whole 18 year old Shane Wright or Connor Bedard situation may become more the norm rather than the exception. Yeah, the, the whole Shane Wright thing is very interesting because I'm going to read a couple other things, just quick notes that I took out of this article. So peak ages for most abilities, and he breaks down all the abilities in this paper, are in the 23 to 25 age territory. Peaks later for special team skills, but earlier for more pure, more individual skills like finishing. And he explains what he means by finishing, but you can probably figure it out if you think about it enough. Per McCurdy, If the peak age for offensive ability is around 23 years old, that means the peak age for many, many players for that skill is appreciably younger. Every team likely has players whose peak in some skills will come uncomfortably soon after they are drafted, or some players will only have two NHL caliber years, and if you don't put them in the NHL in those years, then it is a wasted draft pick. That I found pretty fascinating how you think about it. He he calls it – teams look at asset management, which – in his mind, is kind of a, I don't know, it's a weird term to talk about humans and asset management. It's a cold way to put it. Yeah, but that's what it is at the end of the day. So just to make sure I understand that correctly, so what he's saying is that when you're like Connor McDavy and you're skating the puck all the way up the ice and skating around all the whole other team and <laughs> half of your team and scoring sweet goals where you, that's like 23 years old, then when you're at the point when you're on the power play and you're largely just standing in a shooter's slot and waiting to pull the trigger, you don't you can be a little bit older. Yeah, kinda of, kinda of, a little bit. I think he's just saying teams need to be really careful on think about Shane Wright. They're not playing him, but what if these are his two years and now they're shipping him off to AHL team for his conditioning stint and maybe they keep sitting him or who knows? I mean Obviously, this paper doesn't talk about Shane Wright, but just these teams have to think about it. And I think in turn, hockey card collectors, when we think about hockey cards and who what players were collecting, if you're looking at from the truly that investment hype flipping kind of value, it, it, I think this just helps add another, I don't know what you want to call it, tool to your toolkit when you think about how you do your analysis mm-hmm. on this stuff. The other thing that I remember from the charts you sent me was where on the offensive skill side, the value, the drop in skill level was pretty precipitous. I mean, it Mm -hmm. dropped hard. Yeah, it's a a definitely steeper slope. On the defensive side, it seems like they retain their skills longer. Yep. And then I'll I'll kind of get in, like older players that seem to defy aging, he he says, think about Crosby, Bergeron, Ovechkin, are really just slowly weakening from such a great height that they have a lot of impact despite the effects of age. And if you actually look at that offensive, it goes, you know, it peaks at, what, 23, goes down, 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 and then all of a sudden at the end, it peaks up a little. And I actually didn't, I'm sure he explains why, but at the very end of the career, it, like, peaked up a little. And I can't remember what he said exactly for that, but I remember it was one of those things that I noticed on the chart. Goalies, he looks at goalies, goalies, like we've known, obviously they peak later. Around anywhere from, it looked like 26 to 28. Is when the goalies start peaking, which we've always thought, we've always known. That's why goalies usually enter the league a little bit later. Again, if you're if this fascinates you and you want to look at it, check the research out. It's definitely opened eye, my eyes when looking at players and given me a whole new perspective and kind of got rid of the whole, yep, 28s when they hit their prime. You know, even when we talk about players sometimes, we're like, they're going to a new situation. They're, oh, how old are they? Oh, they're about 28. You know, they're hitting their prime. They're going to have a great year. But maybe that's not the case. So, again, check it out. Link will be in the show notes. So are you saying we should take a break from recording and I should list all my Capri Soft cards on eBay right now? Is that where you're? Hey, I got, I have that PSA 10 Young Guns that I paid so much. What was it? 780 800 somewhere around there. 
it's at a paltry 290-ish now, I think, is the last time I looked. So well, that sale went up a little bit. But oh, did we'll it go? Later. Maybe. We'll get to that. We'll get so things are looking up for you, Troy. All right. All right. Great info there. Uh, we will put the link to the study in the show notes so you can go ahead and check that out. Uh, if you're a data minded person like we are. So we're going to move on to who's not, and we're going to stay with Troy because he's doing such a great job. And he's going to talk about your guy, Ilya Sorokin. Oh yeah. So who's hot? I think you said, who's not, who's hot. We're on, who's, who's hot? hot. We're on the good guys, the good guy, or the, the better performing players right now. Yeah. Ilya Sorokin is in our first. Who's hot. I am glad to see him on the hot list because I honestly think after our about second or third show, I was talking about him, how much I like him, how he's technically one of the best goalies, if not the best goalie in the league from a technical perspective. He, I think he's kind of slipped on the radar. I know people know who he is, but a lot of times I think just being on the Islanders sometimes we forget about him. But he is, like I said, obviously technically gifted. And he is an elite goalie if you look at how he plays. He has been honestly on fire the last five games. He's went 4-1 and one with a 2.39 goals against and a .928 save percentage and one shutout, which was a 49-save shutout against Edmonton. If you can stop 49 shots from that team, I think, I think you should be on the who's hot just by that alone. But he's playing top-notch right now, and, and I hope it continues. Looking at his card values, his 2020 Young Guns PSA 10, Pop 311. I found it going anywhere in the range from 90 to to $100. Beginning in November, it was around the 80-ish range, so there's been kind of a, a little jump. Not, not too big, but a little jump. But it is down from early October when it was trading around the 110-ish range, and that's give or take 20 bucks on that range. It was kind of a little bit all over the place. It would be like 135, 110, 100, 140. So I just kind of averaged it out. But yeah, Mr. Sorokin is playing well. He is playing well. I do feel like that there just isn't a lot of buzz around the Islanders. Yeah. I was looking at player stats the other day, and Matthew with a 1T Barzal, you ever oh, hear yeah. of him? Yeah, I've heard of him. He has something like 483,000 assists this year, and nobody's <laughs> – it's something like really close to that. But, yeah, and he, there's a little bit of like Noah Dobson steam – yeah. Before the season, we saw a little run on his cards, but been pretty quiet. Okay, we got to move on to our next guy. And of course, my <laughs> first contribution to the show, I have to read the name. I'm not sure how to pronounce. What oh, are the odds of that? I know how to say it if you don't. Okay, I'm going to guess, well, actually, though. I guess I, I should. I know where you're going to confuse. I'm probably, I don't either. I just always thought I knew how to say his name. <laughs> now you got me Wait. questioning myself. I know this is what this is what happens. So it's either the ooh or the ah. Uh, yeah, right? I, that's exactly it. So what what do you think? Is it ooh or ah? Uh? I was I was, I was Tim Stutzel, not Stutzel. I thought it was Stutzel too. It might be Stutzel. I'm sure. I, some, and I've heard some people say some really exotic pronunciations. So is it? We'll just say like potato, potato. So it's Tim Stutzel, Stutzel, whatever you prefer. <laughs> Tim, Tim, Timmy S. Timmy S. Timmy with an S. <laughs> He's been a little under the radar, I think, for the past year, really. Haven't didn't really hear from him too much last year. Uh, is that just me, or do you kind of feel that way? Too no, I kind of feel that way. I mean, he always gets. If you watch breaks, obviously, he always gets mentioned. And was it twenty twenty? Was that where his was with mm-hmm. Carell? And yeah. then I remember one time. I mean, I pulled you pulled. I think uh, Stutzel Young Guns for me a long time ago when you were you opened some packs. Oh I, yeah. I remember that. I, remember I got that. it. And I remember looking, Oh sweet. And then I've kind of watched it and it just hasn't really that much excitement around it. Uh, yeah. So pre um, 2021 getting into the sports cards, Josh tried some hockey breaks for some friends. Uh, didn't love it, but, but we did it. His 2022, 23 stats so far. Another note, I'm sorry to digress, but are you not so happy that we Kev, we don't have to say the word early anymore. Yeah, yeah, we're in the season now. We're in the throng, <laughs> throngs, throned, throws of the <laughs> NHL season. Thongs. <laughs> so it's for twenty twenty two twenty three. He's played twenty one games. He has eight goals, fourteen assists for twenty two points. In case you're not good at math, Troy, that's more than a point per game. Nice. In his last five games, he's got five points. So kind of keeping up that streak. 
Last year, just for context, in 79 games played, he had 22 goals, 36 assists for 58 points. So he's definitely pacing well to have a career year. I did find something interesting, though, about him when I was looking at stats. And I'm curious to see what your opinion is of this. So he's played parts of three seasons now and never finished a season positive for plus minus. And through 153 career games played, Troy, he's negative 51 plus minus. Yeah, that's not always good. And I've said this before on the show. If you read enough analytics guys like Micah Blake McCurdy and his ilk, they kind of dismiss plus minus. They don't think it's a good number or a good barometer of a player's ability or worth or value. So they kind of toss it. But they do say if it gets into like crazy number range, there might be something there. But it's really dependent on a lot more than just that player. There's so much other stuff, which we can say anything about hockey. I mean, it's the most random sport there is if you look at analysis around how random hockey is. But so I I don't see it as that worrying yet. But when you get into the minus 150s, <laughs> I think then you might start to question it. But you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. Yeah even if you're not solely responsible for the problem. Um, yeah, I suppose you'd have to compare his plus minus to who he played with and do all that fun stuff. He is centering the first line with Brady Kachuk, brother to Matthew, with two Ts, and Claude Giroux. So he'll keep getting plenty of scoring opportunities, also centering the first power play unit. So I, you know, I think he should have a decent opportunity to put up points through the rest of the year. From a hockey card perspective, his 2020 Young Guns Raw last sold for 40 US dollars on November 29th. It's down about 14% over the past three months, which is a little head scratching to me. I don't know, Troy, is that a buying opportunity? Do you think? I mean, obviously, if you have faith in him, go for it. Buy away. His 2020 Young Guns PSA 10 pop, this surprised me a little bit. 992. Seems low. 992? That seems low to me. Because really? it was like it was him and Kaprizov were the two guys, right? Out of that, I spot. Well, no, there's Laffy. Oh, I forgot. About, duh, I forgot about Laffy. Well, maybe it's I not. I think low. he's a little maybe forgettable. Just, yeah. Well, you asked me grading questions, and uh. oh, here we go again. Here we go. <laughs> other one note. Other note on that that's kind of interesting is sixty three percent jam rate. So if you got them, send them in. <laughs> They're going to jam. Yeah, that's surprising, but it last sold for one hundred twenty five US dollars. On eleven twenty nine as well. He was consistently in the hundred fifty US dollar range at the beginning of November, so that's down a little bit too. So going back to your point, if you're a Stutzel Stutzel truther, <laughs> then probably now is a good time to buy. Okay, the next guy try is a phenom that's taken storm uh, on the whole league, Mister Josh Morrissey. My oh. first question is. When you hear or have to say his name, isn't it not impossible not to think of the band Morrissey? Oh, yeah, the singer. Yeah, it definitely well, is. It's a singer in a band. Isn't Morrissey a singer in a band? I think it is. I don't know. I just know Morrissey is the singer is one of the most difficult people to work with, I've heard. Harder than you? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Way harder That's than crazy. me. Crazy. Could he be the Dark Horse player of the year so far? Oh, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Talk about coming out of nowhere, huh? I would actually love to hear from any Jets fans because we're not going to have great context on this. Did anyone possibly see this coming? Or is this just totally a surprise? Go ahead and message us on anywhere, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. We'd love to know that. So it's his seventh NHL season, Troy. He's having a career year to date. Or his career year to date was last year, actually. Where in 79 games played, he had 12 goals, 25 assists for 37 points. Harley the dog. <laughs> I just give up. Every I time. will mute myself. Just a sec. No, don't mute yourself. We got to hear from Harley is a Morrissey fan. <laughs> now, I just got to ask her, is she a fan of the band or the yeah. defenseman? It's got a lot to say. Holy cow. <laughs> so before last year, he's been typically like a 30 points per year guy. Okay, so last year, career year, 37 points. This year so far, in 21 games played, he has five goals, 20 assists for 25 points. That's a, quite an improvement. 
In the last five games played, Troy, he has four goals, five assists for nine points. That's uh, in fuego, as Stuart Scott used to say, right? Yeah, I'm curious about these numbers. So think about this. What if he ends the season at the same pace? So he goes, what, 20 goals, 80 assists. Does that put you in the conversation for stuff? Or is that – does being an assist machine have as much weight as being a goal-scoring person? I feel well, like – that would be like Roman Yossi's last year. Yeah. Or yeah, year last point, year, right? Good point. Well, funny you say that because I saw a couple articles today – pumping a little Norris hype for him. Mm. And apparently he has a new nickname. It's Josh Norrissey. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. <laughs> We're big on nicknames here, but that's kind of funny. Sorry. I mean, and he's a defense. I totally botched that. I forgot about that. He's a D guy. So it's not like you expect, yeah. you don't expect him to be the other way, like, you know, 40 goals and 30 assists or something. That's kind of why I said Roman Yossi. Okay, so what's more likely, Troy? He comes back down to earth in the next couple of weeks, or do you see him continuing this playing out of his mind? Well, looking at the article I just read on aging specific skills, I would guess he's coming going to come back to earth. This is a momentary blip, and he comes back to earth, being twenty seven years old. So I'm going to go with that. I don't even know how you look this up, but it'd be interesting to see like how many guys went from 35 points one year to 90 the next year. I should subscribe actually to the hockey reference. They have a paid version of their site, which is fantastic. I've used it for free. Like when they've done trials, I just never got around to paying for it, but you could probably look that up. Like they, it has a lot of filtering and specific query stuff you can do. So we'll go through values here in a second, but I think moral of the story is, if you were ever looking for a time to maybe offload any of your uh, Morrissey cards, Mm -hmm. strike while the iron's hot, right? His 2016 Young Gun PSA 10 popped 45, Troy. Last sold for 41 US dollars on November 26, which is $7 more than the highest selling Matthew Barnaby card ever. (laughs) Right? Yep. His raw Young Gun last sold for about $7 in mid-November. There's so few sales, though. It's really hard to... I would love to give you some context of how much that is up or down, but he do doesn't we, have a lot of sales. Do we need to take a trip to Absolute and start digging through the boxes? Yes. <laughs> Don't give away our secrets. <laughs> All right. There it is, Troy. The struggle bus is pulled up. And I got to tell you, man, it's a lonely bus today. We got one guy... It's a sad situation. I this feel hurts. This I don't guy. even want to read this. I don't even want to talk about this. Oh, this hurts. Isn't yeah. it bad enough to be on the struggle bus, but then to have to sit there by yourself and <laughs> think about how poor your life is going Ugh. at the moment? It's uh, not fun. So our guy, Troy, you're, you're, you were higher on him than anyone you know, in your house, anyways. <laughs> uh, Shane, Shane Pinto. He had a blistering start to the season, but... In the last 12 games played, he only has three points, giving him 10 points on the season with eight goals to assist in 21 games played. What a difference a month makes, Troy. He finishes October as the NHL Rookie of the Month yep. and has not gone so well in November for him. I think he's battling some lower body stuff right now, too, that isn't going to help in that regard. He's dropped a 10th in, rookie sc- in the rookie scoring leaders race. I think he was second at one point. He still, though, is second in rookie goals, one behind your guy, Matty Beniers. So that's a one still bright spot. Okay, kind of the same question I just asked you about Morrissey, the defenseman, not the band. Blip in the radar, you think he rebounds? I, I'm, I'm actually pu- feeling like he'll regain the scoring touch a little bit. I want to say I think he'll regain his scoring touch. However, the nagging injury thing, if that's truly – a kind of long-term issue it those those affect people more, more than i think people realize those nagging injuries are just where they can't fix it right away or they have to have wait till like off season for surgery those are always rough so if that's truly going on and he has some lingering issue it might hurt him kind of recovering but i'd like to think he's gonna it's just a blip mm-hmm. and if you recall he missed a big chunk of last year with injuries and that's mm-hmm. why People were so high on him this year because last year was a little bit of a false start for him in that regard. So that's the struggle bus. Sorry, Shane. Oh, I didn't talk about hockey cards. 
2021 Young Gun Raw, last sale was about $15 US. It was in the high teens, low 20s, beginning of November. So honestly, it hasn't fallen too much. Maybe that means that collectors still have confidence Mm -hmm. or are holding and don't want to sell low on on Pinto. Okay, now we have some kind of exciting news, I guess. Big news. From our perspective. Big news announcement. Big news. Announcement time. We're really excited to announce that uh, PWCC is the new partner of the Hockey Cards Gong Show. Very cool. Uh, Very grateful and excited about that. We're going to be doing a number of things with them that we're absolutely looking forward to. One thing we'll be doing on a somewhat regular basis is talking about what we think are some of the more interesting hockey cards in their weekly and premier auctions. Why are we telling you this? It's because if you're a longtime listener of the show, listen to one of our first handful of episodes. We made it very clear from the beginning that at any point, if we chose to partner with any company, we're going to be 100% transparent about it because we never want anyone to think that we're, I don't know, what do you call it, Troy? Trying to hide anything or pump people or something. It's just, you got to be, we want to be 100% transparent. Here's the deal. So you know what's going on. So actually we wanted to start and, and we took a look at their weekly auction going on right now. And one of the things that we've learned in just talking to them a little bit more that I think is kind of interesting is I I wasn't aware how many cards they sell at their weekly auction. It's like 10,000 or more Mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, So it's a pretty big platform and there's quite a bit of hockey on there. I know I looked through a few hundred listings today and I know you looked through a bunch as well. And so we kind of pulled out, we're not going to spend a crazy amount of time but just ones that we think are interested. And this is a weekly auction that's going on right now. So obviously if any of these cards are of interest to you or you're looking for alternative places to buy cards, we would recommend that you check that out. So starting with kind of the little vintage and moving more modern is there's a 1955 Parker's Quaker Oats variation of Jacques Plante, his rookie in SGC six pop one with only two graded higher. So pretty premium Jacques Plant rookie. The highest sale on this card ever was a PSA 7 that sold for 7200 in 2017. And uh, the other little bit of context is there's a PSA 1 that I believe sold in the PWCC weekly auction for $1,230 US dollars back in September. So I'll be curious to see where this one goes. But was he on our Mount Rushmore goalies? Oh, yeah. He, we were the one we debated about, and I won out finally. So I got I got him on there, but he's got his I love his Parkhurst cards. I think they're just a tad out of my range right now. But they are really cool looking. And this one definitely looks really cool if you look at it. Another one that caught my eye was the nineteen seventy four OPG Borea Salming Ricky PSA nine. It's a pop fifteen. There's only four PSA tens. Obviously with his passing last week. I'm just curious to see what happens with the sale and if there's an, an increase the highest sale ever for this card was in September 2018 where it sold for 780 back on the PWCC weekly auction so yeah i'm really curious what this goes for just not not from the morbid sense but i think he was kind of underappreciated until just the recently with that whole tribute um that the Maple Leafs did 2 or 3 weeks ago and then it's obviously his untimely passing i've just read a lot more articles on him i feel like there's a lot of just momentum and people kind of nostalgia and looking back on his career and how just important he was. So it'll be interesting to see where this one finishes up. Okay. The last one that I found, and then I'll let you kind of cover the ones that stood out to you, Troy is, and this is to pay homage to our great friends, sports car cartel, who was amazing on our last episode. Honestly, guys, if you didn't listen to it, you have to, if you care anything about eighties hockey or, OPG. It was, we call that a masterclass because that's honestly what it felt like. He did such an amazing job of taking us through that. And one of the cards we talked about was the 1984 OPG Doug Gilmore rookie. So there's a PSA 10 up for auction right now on PWCC Weekly that has a pop 53. And one of the things that we talked a lot about with Cartel was the low gem rates. So with the POP 53 PSA 10, that's out of 1,409 submitted to date. All-time high for this card is $2,950 in December 2020. It's come down quite a bit since then. 
with the last sale being 1200 on October 30th. So I, I'd be really curious just to now I, I've got a, a much newfound appreciation for 80s OPT. I know I'll be following those cards a lot closer. Yeah, and I kind of took the same route when I did a lot of digging in the PWCC weekly auction stuff. Just I had that sports card cartel segment on my mind, so I wanted to find those cards. And I am pretty sure about 99% of the cards he mentioned, they are. You can find them in the weekly auction. There, there's I think wow. all of them are there. Maybe not. Maybe there's one or two missing. But just the ones that he mentioned that I remembered off the kind of the top of my head. The 85 OPG Mario Lemieux rookie. There's a PSA 9 copy available. The 86 Patrick Waugh, which we talked about in depth. There's a BGS 9 that I saw was available. There's also the Brett Hall rookie card, the Photoshop jersey that's in a PSA 10 holder that's available. The one that I really loved the discussion where you mentioned the Jofa or the Yofa helmet, 1983 OPG Wayne Gretzky. There's a PSA 9 version available on the weekly auction and then the 84 opg wayne gretzky the dual pick where he got his profile picture and as cartel said with his flowing blonde hair and then you have the action shot of him skating there's a copy available on the the weekly auction and specifically just for you josh i found that there's an 81 opg peter stastny rookie psa gem mint this is in the fixed uh, fixed sale or fixed bid. Like they have, people can just list their cards for sale. You don't have to be in the weekly auction or the monthly premiere. There's one for sale for one thousand two hundred fifty dollars or best offer. Are you going to make an All offer? All I need is. A, well, I'm going to try to find. I think a hockey card, Sugar Mama, to get Daddy his card. <laughs> yeah, so that one, that one's out there. And then I also saw for myself in the fixed fixed bid or make an offer section, the marketplace. We'll call it. There's a 2016 Leaf Ultimate Gold with Chechiak, Tony Esposito, Gary Cheevers, and Bernie Perrant, all with autographs. It's a one-on-one. It's auth- authenticated by MBA, and I think that's that Michael Brown authentication. Mike, Mike, sorry. Why do I say Michael Brown? Michael Baker authentication, who, and Josh, you'll have to keep me on task. He was the first PSA grader, or one of the early PSA graders and I believe has that's a lot case. of yeah yeah has a lot of kind of industry respect and he's they're kind of partnered with him to do some of the authentication that card is listed for 1200 us dollars or best offer and this is one where i actually clicked in because i was really curious i wanted to see the card and look at it and it's kind of nice when you click in there's actually a little like seven second video of them moving like holding the card turning it over showing it lots of good pictures and then they show the MBA authentication kind of sticker on the back. So those are some of the ones that I found. And I will say, and if you have a lot of money, there's a you can go super high end in these things. And then they have their like premier auctions, which I believe the November mm-hmm. one's done. The December one's coming out. We just got the email about the preview items that are up there. But yeah, very cool. It's just a, a great example to me that you get stuck in your ways, I think, mm-hmm. at times in the hobby. And you kind of go back to your tried and true sources. And it's just good in a lot of, uh, not just with auctions or auction companies, but to kind of push outside your own bubble and look. Mm -hmm. Because I spent like way too much time in there. And there's a couple of things I might, I'm not going to say which ones because I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb. (laughs) Um, But yeah, and, and so we're looking forward to working with PWCC. We'll probably do a little bit more on the recap side, typically, but given that the the weekly one is underway and it was a great opportunity just to browse through the cards and we would recommend everyone do that because you might find some real cool stuff. And last thing I'll say, too, is there's a lot of like really old vintage, like pre-war mm-hmm. cards, too, that uh, I spent quite a bit of time ogling over, if that's the word. Yeah, I will say the amount of cards you can find, I mean, you can find a lot of stuff and there's a lot of cards. So it definitely, mm-hmm. it behooves everyone to check it out and see if there's anything there that they like. Okay, let's move on to hobby news. So we have a bunch of quick notes. NHL scoring is continuing to be ridiculously high, Troy. Prime example was last night, so it'd be Tuesday night. There was a major defensive showdown between the Kraken and the Kings. And the Kraken finally found a way to score a little bit to come out with a 8-9 to nine victory. 9-8 wow. victory. 9-8 
So 17 goals in one game, which I have a trivia question for you now, because I actually counted one by one. Oh, here we go. And I'm curious to see how close you're going to get. Okay, so with a minimum of 17 games played, Troy, how many players as of yesterday, when I looked it up, are at a point per game or higher in the NHL? Take a guess. Do we know how much the scoring rate is up this year? It's up a little bit from last year, but last year, this year and last year up significantly from the past okay. like 20 so years preceding. Where my head has went is like, if I could, if I knew the increase, I don't think it's this high. I would say it's like 10%. And I know there's 23 players on an NHL roster. Two of those are goalies. 21 mental math. I am going to so say... These are guys that are poising for 80 points or more. I am going to say... Oh, let's go 55 to 60. I'm going to take a range. 55 to 60 hit players. You kind of nailed it. It's 60 on the numbers. It's 60? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yay for me, I guess. Now, I, I don't even know how I got there, but <laughs> I guess. That was good deductive reasoning, Troy. I, I guess it. it worked. I don't know. Someone's going to be like, I can't believe. Some mathematician's going to be like, I can't believe <laughs> what he was doing it actually worked. Isn't that amazing, though? That, that is crazy. Players That's crazy are averaging with them. And again, I wanted to make it a little bit arbitrary to pick 17 games, but I didn't want to like pick a guy who just came back from injury and has four points in three games and count that. So 17, I thought it was a decent enough minimum sample size. Okay. Just because he's determined to ruin my life. <laughs> of course, Rope hints, gosh, had to go sign an eight year extension with Dallas for 66.7 million U.S. For an average annual value of eight point four five million, he has twenty four points in twenty two games this season. He's one of the sixty eight goals, sixteen assists. That's kind of a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's good to see. It's good to see NHL salaries. I like it when the NHL salaries get a little higher because you always hear about these massive NBA contracts when they have like twelve guys on a roster or whatever it is. Uh, you know basketball better than I do, but and hockey's usually. I mean, hockey usually lags way behind on on the average salary, but it's. Obviously, it's a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. It's not like it's like they're poor, but it, I like to see it going up a little bit. I want to see him get paid, too. Yeah. But I know a big issue is a hard cap in hockey. Yeah. And so I just wonder, this is the type of player that is always so tough for sports teams because he's really good and he's playing really good. But is he a superstar? No. Does he want to get paid like a superstar? Yeah. You know, if he continues to play like he has, it'll be good money. You know, but you speak of that. Hard, it's kind of like the Fiala thing. Yeah, you speak of that hard cap, and I just, man, I swear, the Athletic should just give us, send us money because I talk about them every day. But the Athletic did an article on there's some some crazy thing in the collective bargaining agreement that these uh, teams are doing. I can't remember for the life of me what it is, but it, they're really manipulating the system. How it wasn't intended to get around some of these cap issues. Um, it's it's pretty fa- it's pretty interesting to see how smart these teams and how they figure stuff out. Are we going to have like a Bobby Bonilla situation? Oh God! Where like Miko Rantman gets paid a million dollars <laughs> till he's 124 years old? Yeah, if you don't know the Bonilla Earlier. situation, read about that. It, Bernie Madoff's involved. It's uh, it's nuts. It's crazy how he got that whole annuity thing. I don't know when it ends. Like 2030 ish, somewhere in there. What day is Bobby Bonilla day? I, can, I think it's in May or something. Uh, I can't remember, though. I could be way off. Wanted to quickly mention the NHL three stars of the week. Star number one, J-Rob, we're going to talk about in a little bit. In four games last week, at six goals, two assists. Not bad for eight points. Your guy, Troy, Josh Morrissey, the defenseman, not the band, in four games had three goals, four assists for seven points. And Ilya Sorokin went 3-0, and 1.32 goals against, and .96 three save percentage. Next kind of quick hitting topic is... Our Ovi watch update. So Ovi scored two goals Tuesday night, which were his four and second and four and third on the road in his 18 year career, passing Wayne Gretzky for the most goals on visiting ice in NHL history. Okay, Troy, this is starting. <laughs> I I love I love the Ovi chase. It's a story. It's probably my favorite story. It's one of the things I'm most excited to. But I'm kind of starting to wonder: Are we going to get to the point where it's like Ovi scored his 237th goal on Tuesday? I was going to say, I was going to say, scored his you know third four hundredth goal between seven p.m. and ten p.m. <laughs> time frame, putting him past Wayne Gretzky's mark. Scored his 384th goal <laughs> facing West. <laughs> Passing Gordy Howe for the month. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm probably being mean here to the media. Anyone stands up for the media? I, was, ever. I think it's cool that they find these stats. I was that, that's interesting. Yeah, it's like it's a slow news day when you're 
kind of digging that up. But it does, you know, it is, or it is worth saying what he's continuing to do at 37 years mm-hmm. old is just nutty and probably not talked about enough. That's where I wish the focus would be, just on his general play. He kind of has the Brady effect, but I was noticing the other day, you know how like, most people think Brady look He looks old. Yeah. Ovechkin does. Yeah, he does. I mean, he's... he's... I love it, though. He's the silver fox, right? He's not hiding it. Yeah. He's not hiding the gray hair. I don't think he's eating avocado ice cream. <laughs> no. He's creaming people on the ice, yeah. that's for sure. He's definitely a thug. Oh, breaking news. Bobby Bonilla Day is July 1st. There we go. Yeah, I thought it was more like in July. You're right. Okay, good. All right, we do have a couple local card shoutouts we want to throw in there. It is Thursday. This one's from John Iafalo on Twitter. This weekend is the Philadelphia Sports Card and Memorabilia Show. It's December second through fourth. You can get complete information at www.phillyshow.com. Oh my God, I said www like it was 1997. (laughs) Sorry about that. At phillyshow.com. It's at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. Hours are Friday 3 to 8, Saturday 9 to 5, Sunday 9 to 3. You can buy day or weekend passes via their website. Heard from a couple people that there's a little bit of hockey, not super great. Obviously very Philly-centric. Might be a fun show to attend if you're in the neighborhood. Then there's a couple from Fred Rank Sports on Instagram. Uh, he There's two shows. There's an Evolution Card show that's uh, two, Sunday, December 4th, 10 to 3. Location is the Aurora Royal Canadian Legion Branch 385 in uh, 105 Industrial Parkway in North Aurora, Ontario. Admission is $2 and kids 12 and under are free. Then there's another Evolution Sports Card show. Sounds like the following weekend on Saturday, December 10th. This one's at... 233 Center Street E in Richmond Hill, Ontario. Or like Troy typed on Ontario. Oh, I did type on Ontario. It's kind of funny. I'm just that's, kind of funny. that's now the, gonna be the way I stay in Ontario and everyone will be mad at me. On Ontario. Mississauga. Make sure Mississauga. That... I'm gonna say it Mississauga. Mississauga. I, got that. I still remember Mississauga. that. Mississauga. I still remember that. Yeah, well, who was it at the show that said that his wife heard us pronounce it <laughs> Mississauga and I almost was almost made her yeah, almost, for... she uh, almost fainted. <laughs> Make sure, though, that you send us any local car shows that feature hockey, because we want to promote those on the podcast, which we do every Thursday. Okay, this one I'm excited for. I sent a lot of time, Troy. It's like three pages of notes. Oh, boy. Almost. We're going to do a little, I don't know what we call this. If it's a comparison, if it's a debate, if it's a discussion, if it's just two friends talking hockey cards, whatever it is. We're going to talk about your guy, J-Rob, versus our boy, Kaprizov. We got to be honest here. This is not a bias or an unbiased conversation. <laughs> if Troy and I could, we would adopt Kirill <laughs> and we would make his lunch every day and drive him to practice. That's how much we love him. But we're going to try to our best abilities to think beyond our hearts and analyze this objectively. Right. Can you do that, Troy? I think so. Okay, here's why I think this is an interesting comparison. Both, of course, are 2020 rookies. Oh, God. Look at the next slide of my notes. Oh, I said each should be entering their prime. Oh, we know that. Maybe Might, not. They maybe not. Maybe they are. Maybe they're on the later end of that age curve. But go read that in-depth report research paper earlier. Oh my gosh! And I think with the emergence of Robin Robertson this year, he's obviously played well. But even last year, there just wasn't a lot of hobby love mm-hmm. for him. He's kind of under the radar. Boy, could you have done well if you'd have went all in on Robertson last year? Nope. Holy cow! So I think they're both really hobby relevant. And I think the overarching question that I want us to consider here is who has, do you think, has more long-term hobby value? Okay, so we'll get into it. Age-wise, Kaprizov is 25. Eh. Robertson's 23, so he should be right at his peak, Yep. according to Troy and Matt. Depending on the skill, remember that. Even though... Offensive skill, yeah. they do lump into one, but just remember, there's they talk about power play. I mean, they talk about a ton. It's a. Oh, I just want to sit here and read this paper to everyone. And see how many? Who's that one listener that makes it all the way through with me? From a draft perspective, Kaprizov was taken in the fifth round in the 2015 draft. He was the 135th pick. I would say not bad. Yeah, I think. Why he, can he, we? He fell though, here earlier. Yeah, he fell though because of the exactly that reason. They people knew that he was going to be hard to get over here. There was so much going on with his KHL contract and that situation. I mean, we tried to, the Wild tried to get him earlier and they wouldn't budge on him. Darn you, Putin. <laughs> Robertson was taken in the second round. He was the 39th pick in the 2017 draft. From a measurables perspective, Kareli is 5'10, 202 pounds. 
Robertson is 6'3", 200 pounds. Both are left wings and both shoot left-handed. I wanted to do a little bit of a play style comparison and particularly to do a little bit of research on Robertson because we see Kaprizov. So we, mm-hmm. he, we are like a, from a bias, it's an unfair advantage towards him because we see him so much more and just kind of try to give a little comparison of how these guys play. I'll start with Kaprizov. These are mainly just my observations, Troy. So you throw anything else that you've noticed in here too. He's a relentless worker, wins almost every puck battle. It's mm-hmm. uncanny how often he comes. The puck will go into the corner. It'll be Kaprizov versus everybody on the other team, <laughs> and he walks away at the puck every time. I don't understand it. He's small in height, but he's tough. He gets the dog snot beat out of him yeah. all game. And with the exception of the whole Drew Doughty high stick kerfuffle thingy, yeah. he does, doesn't seem to phase him much. He just kind of puts his head down and keeps going. A lot of respect to our guy for that. He's an amazing skater, especially on his edges. I encourage anyone to look up Twitter, YouTube videos of him doing, is it the Tomahawk? No, it'd be Mohawk. 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 Mohawk, yeah. When he puts his skates pointing out, like he always does that when he enters the zone. He'll basically enter his zone, stick his skates out, do a Mohawk, and then he basically he's trying to get the defender not to know which way he's going because he's so good at changing directions from that Mohawk. It's. I thought I saw somewhere once too where they, they, uh, tracked him or and that he can pick up speed while mohawking too <laughs> that would be like he's just so that would be pretty he's nuts just, he's just so good at it well, he does uh, there. if you ever watch him him and mckinnon so you'll hear the term linear crossovers where they are you'll see them enter the ice and you always see them going like kind of left and right but they're doing crossovers and that's they're called linear crossovers and they're just gaining speed the whole time they never lose speed they keep gaining and gaining and gaining so maybe he's figured out some way to do the mohawk and rotate his hips enough to give him some acceleration and honestly after watching every game i'm as goal obsessed as anyone else and especially from a hobby perspective my favorite part about watching him though is the ridiculous passes he makes all the time his vision of the game and the ice is top i mean it's you know master yeah. yeah he's definitely like dry sidle in that aspect we're making crazy passes and the thing is if they don't connect it's really most of the time it's because the other players weren't expe- like i obviously i'm stealing your next point but he like they weren't expecting it it's not like he made a bad pass he just made a ridiculous pass that they weren't expecting it's very rarely he just gives the puck away on a terrible pass it, it's kind of amazing how how he can just do that There is a play, and this is totally off memory here, but it was a week or two ago, and he was getting, like, clobbered along the boards, and Boldy was sitting in front of the net, and basically had a, like, by the way, the angle the goalie was playing had a wide open net, and all of a sudden the puck lands on Boldy's stick, and he was like, what? Boldy was shocked. (laughs) And, of course, he, like, whiffed on it, because I don't think he ever in a million years expected to have the puck on his stick. And it's gotten a little bit better because I think now players on the wild are learning to mm-hmm. expect it. But if you went back to last year, he missed out on so many assists, Troy, mm-hmm. because they just weren't ready for his passes. And so I don't know how many more he could have, but it's more than a few. That's for sure. And then last thing I put is he's got a great shot and he can score in multiple ways. I feel like he has been missing a little bit of his shots this year, especially on the one-timer angle. But I don't know. Do you have any other, if you talk about like Kaprizov's play style, any other points that you want to throw in there that I didn't make? No, I think you covered most of all the big ones. Okay. So with Robinson, like I said, it's harder because I had to do, I read about 10 articles and here's kind of what I came away with. It's going to be a little bit shorter because I just don't have the experience of watching him play a bunch. What stood out to me is he's a pure goal scorer. He's got great hands and shot and really high hockey IQ. I saw a lot that he's really, really good in tight spaces and around the net. He has a knack for anticipating rebounds. He can score. He's not like a totally like a Dino Cicerelli (laughs) who are Zach Parisi that gets all their goals just pounding in rebounds. But apparently he's got a knack for it. And he has really, really good body control and can protect the puck and not lose it, which to me sounded a lot like Kaprizov too. I don't know. Do you have any other observations that you've had? About Robinson. No, and this is going to sound terrible. I I just have, I, when I watch Dallas, I'm always watching Ottinger. <laughs> I'm like looking up Ottinger highlights. I always forget how big Robertson is. I always, for some reason, I feel like he's this tiny guy. No, he's six foot three. Like he is a big dude. He has a big dude. I keep, for, I, I forget about that all the time. And co- comparatively, like we talked about Kaprizov's pretty small. Yeah. But the Leafs are not pencils. Like who is it? Who's the last guy we did on the Zegras. No, no, the rookie deep dive last week, wasn't it? 165 oh, pounds. Ken, 
Ken Johnson. Yeah, he was just, Trevor Zegers is really slight too. Yeah. All right. So from a performance comparison, looking at stats a little bit. So this year so far, Kaprizov has played 21 games. The Wild are in some like they're like on a bye week or something. <laughs> I don't know. It's like they're never going to play again. He's got it's on 21 games played. He's got 13 goals, 14 assists, 27 points. That's 1.29 points per game. I haven't felt like he's been clicking yet which actually kind of impresses me about Kaprizov because he's got pretty good numbers and I'm just haven't felt like he's dominated any game. And so I'm hopeful as a wild fan that there's going to be a streak coming soon where he just goes out of his mind, much like Jason Robertson has this year. So in 23 games played, he's got 19 goals, 17 assists, 36 points, 1.57 points per game. So compared to 1.29, hands down, Robertson's having a better year. Mm-hmm. Can't argue that. Well, let's look at the career. So in 157 games played, Cappy Dalla Bill Carrill has 89 goals, 99 assists, one shy of 100 for 187 points. And his career average of points per game is 1.19. Where Robertson, on the other hand, has played 151 games, so six less, has 77 goals, 84 assists for 161 points. So he's 26 points from his career behind Kaprizov, and that's 1.07 points per game. A little bit deeper dive on the stats here, just to throw some other interesting ones, is Kaprizov in his career has 537 shots compared to 448 for Robertson. Game-winning goals, Kaprizov has 10, Robertson has 17. So is Robertson a little more clutch? Does that mean anything, Troy? Or nothing? Is it just coincidence? I don't know. It's such a it seems like a smaller sample size, but I don't know. And then the core C4 percentage... So Kaprizov for his career is at 53.7. Robertson's a little bit better at 56.2. So anything on the stats perspective jump out to you there? No, I mean, it's pretty interesting how, I mean, they are fairly similar. Yeah, really I mean, similar. Really similar. So that that's interesting to see. I didn't, I actually wouldn't have known that without having this straight in front of me. Remember, so we're going to try to answer for ourselves and help you answer the question, who has better long-term value at the end of this. And so we'll keep chugging along here from a hockey cards perspective. Here's what's kind of happening now and happened to date. So if we look at, they're both 2020 young guns looking at their PSA 10 current values, Kaprizov 300, Troy went up last sale (laughs) went from 296 to 300. I'm slowly crawling back. Robertson's at 460. So in the past six months, Kaprizov's Young Guns PSA 10, which Troy bought for almost $800, <laughs> is down 40%. And there's been 288 sales in the last six months. Robertson is up 116%, but there's only been 64 sales in the past six months. Here's the really kind of fascinating one is pop mm-hmm. count. So Kaprizov's, the pop count in his Young Guns PSA 10 is 2,519 it's the fifth highest of any hockey card ever. So people went bananas. And, and if you recall when yeah. I first started, it was one of the most submitted cards to PSA for like a five month stretch. It's I'm I'm mind blown by how much hype he got. I don't know. I just I mean I, we knew he was good. We knew he was awesome. We're in Minnesota. We see it all the time. But man, did he resonate with other places. And it is crazy just how high that pop count is. So comparatively, Robertson's pop count on his 2020 Young on PSA 10 is 376. So we're comparing. Not for long. <laughs> 519, 376. And that's my question. Is, is Are we going to see a liftoff now where it's literally going to be Robertson pop counts to the moon? Which if it does anything similar to... Kaprizov, then you're going to probably see a little bit of downward price pressure, right? Yeah, I mean, or just being in Dallas is that does that do anything? Like, I don't know. It's Southern state, we might have, uh, we should have called in uh, Casey at Reeds on this one, get his perspective. But yeah, that I mean, that 376 is way low. Like, I never expected it to be that low. Well, and even think of when we talked about Tim Stutzel Stutzel. That was 992. So he's at like a third, well, yeah. 40% of what Stutzel Stutzel is. <laughs> I think that's just his name on our show. So at least, <laughs> so for, <laughs> we get it wrong every time, but maybe we get it right every time too. Yeah. So we should start pronouncing everyone every single way we think it can be pronounced. And then yeah. one of them will be right. Then we satisfy everybody. Okay. So beyond Young Guns, wanted to look at a couple other cards that I thought were interesting. It'd be great to compare the cup, but I don't know. For some reason, I couldn't find any sales. <laughs> hey, oh. It's 2020 SP Authentic Future Watch. Auto. I went with PSA 10. So Kaprizov's last sale was 2,800 US. 
on November 30th, where Robertson was 1100 US on November 19th. So I was like, week and a half ago for Robertson, I'm guessing it'd be a little bit more right now. To me, though, this is a, goes back to that comparison of their young guns. And to what degree does Kaprizov's pop count affect pricing? His uh, future watch is born than double Robertson, but his young guns is less. PSA 10. Mm-hmm. Right. And with the future watch auto being on a 999, we know that there is a controlled yep. limit to those cards. Last card I want to look at is the 2020 OPG Platinum Seismic Gold, which is just a favorite of mine. So that's why I included it. I compared the non auto version. So it's out of 50. Got a funny story about that in a second. So current value, Kaprizov last sold on July 24th for 800. Is that raw? That was ra- that was raw. The last Robertson sale, and I just did a social media post like an hour ago because I couldn't believe this. SGC 10, again, seismic gold out of 50. Gold is kind of like the magic mm-hmm. selling card. 300 US SGC 10 on November 20th. Bravo to whoever bought that. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, that's a job. Well done then. So I was chatting with uh, one of our friends, uh, Hit Him High Sports Cards. I was chatting with him about this card a little bit and just mentioned to him just kind of randomly that I actually prefer the seismic gold out of the non-auto version that's out of 50 Mm -hmm. versus the auto version which is out of 25 and his response i I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this because i just thought it was really funny is he's like it's such an american perspective (laughs) he's like you guys love your prism cards you love all the flashy gold and how clean they are and it is true and and i as i thought about him like he's probably right because the auto kind of takes away from the shiny gold yeah your eyes your eyes initially go to the auto rather than the shiny gold so I guess I'm a guilty American, and <laughs> I kind of prefer the out of 50. I just flabbergasted that somebody picked that up for $300, and I'm mad that it's not me. If it's one of our listeners, please reach out because we want to give you kudos. I'll give you a hint. Somebody, and I don't want to say this on the air, because, but somebody that we know very well tagged in the post the person that they say bought the card. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So you can go look at our post and find it there. It's a way to get our tra- more traffic to Instagram for you. <laughs> there you so go. You like how there I did go. that? Just funnel them. Speaking on the fly. Funnel them right there. Okay, so we've looked at their, what, huh, measurables, how they came in the league, their stats, their cards. We even did a listener poll. That's how in-depth we want to go in the J-Rob versus Dollar Bill Kirill debate. So I did an Instagram poll the other day asking the question, who will have better long-term hobby value, Capri or Robertson? Here's the results, Troy. It was crazy close. We had something like 150, 200 people vote, which isn't bad for an Instagram poll. Are you looking at the notes or no? Yep. Oh, all right. Can't answer. So Kaprizov, by a whisker, wins 51% to 49%. I love that. I love that. It's oh, That's basically evenly split. We're a nation divided, Troy. Yeah, someone probably mistakenly selected Kaprizov, so it's probably 50-50. Did you vote? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who did you vote for? No, I did not vote. No, I stayed in, I I stayed impartial. I stayed impartial. That's good. America cannot decide, and Canada, <laughs> and Sweden, or Germany, or whoever. We're a world divided. We're not a nation. Yeah. We're, we're a world divided. So that's kind of the background. Okay, now I want to get into the discussion part of this. So here's my, like, my takeaway questions when it comes to both Kaprizov and Robertson, and because you're the only other person on this podcast, <laughs> I get to ask you these questions. It defaults to me. It defaults to you. Okay, so question number one. Do you see one or both of these players getting to that? And let's talk about from a hobby perspective to the Matthews, McKinnon, McCarr, McDavid type status level. Okay, and I can see your second question. I think this almost plays into that second question a little bit. I I actually think, can I read your second question too? Just so people agree. Yeah, that's fine. Second one is, if you had to bet on which of these guys will have a better long-term value, who would it be? I think I lean towards J Rob right now over Kaprizov. Maybe it's because I got burned on Kaprizov. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's why. But I just think with Kaprizov's age and how much abuse he's taking, I think that stuff's eventually going to catch up. And I think it's going to catch up sooner than we think, which gives him, if he's, I mean, he's 25 now, it gives him five years runway between before he hits 30. I think J Rob has a little more room to keep building on his career. Obviously, they're both ridiculous players, but I just, I don't like, the worries me about Kaprizov is how he's playing, like his style right now and being ultra physical and getting beat up every night and banged up and everything. So I kind of lean towards J-Rob on this one. You traitor. <laughs> 
You should be so ashamed. Yeah. Actually, I kind of, I'm kind of with yeah, you. Yeah, I, I it, hate saying that. I know, I really, really do. But okay, so I want to break that you what you said down a little bit. The one thing I'll say in Kaprizov is he's yes, he's smallish, right, five ten. He has two hundred pounds. He's the same weight as J. Rob, so he's built. He's got a good physique, try. Yeah, but I think just the he's got a good beach body. The amount of times he just gets goes gets slashed, gets punched, gets that stuff adds up, man. After a while, I don't know if J. Rob takes the same abuse, but I've definitely seen it firsthand with Kaprizov. And I just we worry. have Ryan Reeves now. Yeah, that's true. We do have Reeves, but I'm worried. And plus, Kaprizov, Kaprizov started his career a little later, and I think that's going to hang over him. Obviously, it didn't stop his <laughs> young guns from being submitted to the moon. Well, you've got, okay, here's what's going against Kaprizov. You've got his age, which he may be, maybe he's a Ovechkin type that scores 50 goals till he's 37. I hope so. Right? In that case, no big deal. Please, Lord, make that happen. <laughs> he's Russian, which, is that still a thing or isn't it? I don't know. You got a lot of Russians that are pretty good right now, right? Svechnikov, Kaprizov, um, the guy who scored the most goals on a th- Thursday evening ever. Well, I remember. I remember there used to be a little talk about do are Russian players devalued because they're Russian? And yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, and I don't think Kaprizov obviously has ties to Putin since he tried to ex- escape. But that's always one of those little hanging threads around Ovi, which I don't think's affected him. But Ovi's pretty seems like he's pretty tight with Putin, or he's pretty smart and not upsetting Putin. But I don't. I don't know if that's a thing. It, we've heard about it. We've heard. Yeah. Well, and then on the. Robertson side, right? He's American. So some people say that holds you back. Yeah, like Dallas, you and Dallas, in order Dallas to and American. So you're, you're playing in the South and you're an mm-hmm. American. So that, I mean, obviously those probably work against you a little bit. Does the team factor in? I, I would, you, you oh, know, man. here's how here, think about the teams though. I see Dallas win in a cup before I see the wild win in a cup. How dare you <laughs> speaking truth? Cause I, they have Ottinger. Yeah. Uh, Minnesota teams are allergic to winning, so there's that, too. They do have Ottinger. We don't have Rope Hints, either, right? Nope, fat contract. Fat contract. We do have Matt Boldy. We got Flower flopping around, and we have Jesper Wallstick coming. Right? That's true. We do have so the, the, we do have your the next one. Equalizer. Yeah, we do have the next one coming. I just, I don't know. Right now, if I look at both of them, I think, I think J-Rob is leading on my survey of who's going to have... Okay you know, the better long-term value. Now, again, let's go back. Do we see any either, either of these getting to the Matthews, McKinnon, McCarr, McDavid status? I truly don't know. I, I don't know. Okay, so the candidates for that, right, who are the current best candidates? I would say it's Jack Hughes, Kaprizov, and Robertson, right? I can't think of anyone else not in that group already that is closer than any of those yeah. guys to getting there. So it's just a matter of, I think, if they do it – and. This goes into it. We're not going to get into this today. It's something that I'm really interested in, but is really kind of, we get so excited about players all the time and kind of think like I could just personally rattle off in the last two months, 20 guys that I've been, Ooh, you know, I like this guy, but the reality as we know is that upper echelon value tier of players is very, very small. And there's only a couple of guys every few years that ever get to that point. So it really does come down to, I I don't think that Jack Hughes, Kaprizov, and Robertson are going to be in that group. It doesn't seem realistic to me. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be, if any of them, one, maybe two, if it's a rare exception. Even Dreisaitl's not in that group. Nope. So, okay, last question. Then we'll move on. If when the cup comes out, well, when... We know it's coming out. A month after it's out, which players, so Kaprizov or Robertson, RPA out of 99 is selling for more? I feel like these are good questions. I know. Given your, like, I'm, like, well, this I'm one, here's, where, here's where my thought process goes. It's like, does Kaprizov still have that? Is he still going to have that momentum just from how, how the young guns went? I think, and you, we watch enough breaks to know people really still want Kaprizov. They love his cards. They want the patches. I don't hear that about J Rob when they when they talk about those sets. They, you know, they bring up the name, but they don't it's not like people going crazy trying to get it and the bidding going crazy on like the wild when those sets are being broken. I'm, Just because you got hosed on <laughs> your young guns purchase, I feel like that uh, it's a little bit that that might be clouding your judgment. I'll go back to again, 
So let's talk about a review very, very quickly that pop count, right? The the second point mm-hmm. I made after the pop count was there's been 288 Caprisa PSA 10s sold in the last six months and 64 Robertson, right? So that's well, yeah, I'm leaning. Times. I'm actually leaning to Caprisa on this question out of the for the. It's about time. <laughs> I know I was actually leaning towards Rob or uh, sorry, Caprice off. You know, you don't have to convince me. I, I understand. I was just trying to out- think out out loud. So I would say Caprice. So, so yeah, I would say that currently Caprice off has a definitive edge on the high, high stuff today. It's just going to come down to what happens between now and when the cup comes out, hopefully before their hall of fame ceremonies <laughs> and where kind of their seasons are at, I think. But Robertson definitely. I so I'm gonna guess Caprice off there. I don't know. I thought that was interesting, didn't you? Oh yeah, I like looking at that stuff. Okay, you ready for the quickest new product release segment ever? I just read it. it. Took me ten seconds. Nothing new, of course. It does look like Series One retail comes out December 14th. Next tough question for you: Is that the only release in the month of December? I'm gonna say yes. I think we would. I feel like it is too, and yeah. I believe that that's it's just mind blowing to me. No, nope. maybe we get because I just I can't. I always go back to like a checklist, a checklist release. I think it would be released now if there was something coming out in the first or second week. If it's not then, then you're not going to release a checklist and release a product during Christmas. To me, that doesn't make sense. I don't know. I've been wrong before. No. I could be wrong again. Okay, I had to throw this in too. It's kind of a tangent, but I've been wanting to say this to you for like weeks, ever since we got back from the expo. Did you pick up on when we were chatting with Billy for a long time, Billy Celio at Upper Deck, who was just on the show a couple weeks ago. Go check that out. It, it was a great interview too. That when he was talking about Series 1, he referred to it as UD1. Oh, that's cool. And I... I think I know. I know. That's how the cool kids say it. So that's what we got to say now. So we got to we got to spread UD one. UD one. Well, I'll, like say, I'll say this: Billy is definitely a lot cooler than me. So if that's what he says, I think that's what the cool people say. So Billy, we're gonna go. Right. We're gonna go with UD one. So when you guys hear us say UD one, it means that we're like cool now. We're gonna say and it, and we'll get like a hundred comments. <laughs> <laughs> what are stop you talking saying about? It, stop you saying it like that. Yeah. So that's new product releases. Hope you all enjoyed it. Okay, we'll finish the show like we do every Thursday, Troy, with our listener mailbag. Thank you, everyone who sent questions. Got a number of really good ones again this week. Love doing this segment. So hopefully people will continue to participate going forward. This one's right up your alley. It's from our good friend Thaddeus Stewart, and he asked this question on the Hockey Cards Gong Show Discord, which anyone can get access to if they support us via Patreon. That is question, Troy, is what is your process for logging cards? I'm just going to shut off my microphone, drink my wine, and let you live in your glory here. No, I, I, so my process for logging cards, I do it very manually. It actually, I have a Google Sheet, and I have about 16 different you know, column headers or data points, and I just go through my cards and I enter them. Now, it really, really helps that they publish checklists by Beckett and Card Connection, and they have Excel versions. So I can copy and paste when I need to. It's not like I'm sitting there manually typing everyone's name, teams, et cetera. But I try to do my best to just log all the information. Do you have that tiny I little elves that work for you? And- <laughs> no, no, it, it doesn't. It actually doesn't take that long. Because, you know, if you buy a couple boxes of Series 1, after you do the first one, then it's just copy. Because most of the time you get a lot of, you get kind of duplicates. So it's a lot of copy paste and stuff like that. But, you know, on the, on the I, cat- I need to clarify something here, too. Sorry, just for everyone's edification, because this is a really important point that people need to understand about you. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. You log every single card, whether it be a base card or every one. Right? Yes. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I log every one. And then I... How big is your spreadsheet now? Oh, it's, I don't know, twelve to 15,000, somewhere in there. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so I do. I do. I log them all in my, in my spreadsheet. And then after I log them all, I put them into the boxes that I have. And I have boxes by base, boxes by inserts, parallels, autographs. Those are all kind of one box. And then they're per sport. And then I actually put them in the boxes by player name. That's how I sort them. To me, that's always been the easiest because doing the show and you see, oh, this player is doing well. This player is doing poor. At least I can go right to that player in my box and have all all their cards if I ever want to do anything with them, which I usually don't. I just look at them and go, oh, that's interesting. But yeah, that's how I do it. I log with this, I log all these data points in a spreadsheet and then I put them in the boxes and then I have a little storage area I put them in. 
So that's, that's how I do okay, it. Okay, I'm going to butcher a movie quote, but your whole process makes me think of the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And at one point, Ferris goes to Cameron and says something to the effect of, Cameron, your anal retentive attention to detail <laughs> never ceases to amaze me. Yeah, it's true. It is, it's, but like I said, it's therapeutic, man. I, I actually really enjoy it. Like, I like logging and I like sorting and I like putting them in their boxes. So to me, it's like therapy. I put on like a show or a podcast and go to work. Do you put on the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast? No. Or is it weird to listen to yourself? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I to listen, listen to, to our show. I'm, I'm not that repulsed by our voices, so I do listen every once in a while. Yeah, I do not. <laughs> okay, next question. Oh, for me, Ice Card Ladder. They yeah. have a feature where you can store your collection. And what I love about that is it attracts the value. And you get a daily email, which is somewhat <laughs> terrifying to open, that tells you how much your collection went up in value or down in value for that day. It's probably a bad idea to look at. It's kind of like they say with your 401k, don't check the value yeah. every day. You drive yourself nuts. But there's something I have a love-hate relationship with that. So that's what I do. Okay, great friend from ours. Another one from Gancho Discord, 419 Sports Guy. Another one, Troy. It's like these questions are like written for you today. <laughs> Why do goalies not get the hockey love skaters do in terms of value? Or do they, and I'm just jaded? No, I don't think they do. I think he's not jaded. Um, it's a fair comparison that goalies are like pitchers in baseball. We've always heard pitchers are undervalued and goalies, maybe not undervalued, but they just don't get the hobby love that goal scorers do. Um, for goalies, you know, it's very hard to be consistent for a long period of time. They're always the scapegoat when teams lose. That They're the first person that usually gets blamed. Even if they have a couple bad games in a row after they've been hot, there's, it just seems to crush any momentum they have with values running up during a season. I think peaking later in their careers probably has something to do with it as well. Kind of, we mentioned in the show where goalies typically, not always, but typically don't get into the NHL till their later years. So it might be five to six years after that rookie card came out. And you know, it's very rare that a goalie gets drafted and plays in the NHL the next season. I think we're seeing more of it lately, but that's one of the things that that's kind of holding, holding goalie values back a little bit, I believe. Yeah, totally. Like uh, another great example, is sort of the, football running back right mm -hmm. that just doesn't seem to have the value and i just threw in there similar to you that it's goal obs goal obsessed right whoever's going to score the most goals score the most points is going to get the most love yeah and so, like the, the maybe the over. i don't know if it's a scapegoat answer we can just always say on this stuff it's like that's what the hobby deems that's kind of what it is yeah. i mean <laughs> we can try to explain the reasons for it but no you're not it's definitely something that's real it's a fact okay next question comes from josh who's a co-host of the hockey cards disco <laughs> or hockey cards gong show podcast troy based on the kirill kaprizov j rob conversation why do you hate kirill kaprizov <laughs> i'm sorry kirill i love him i love kirill okay all right just needed you to clarify that <laughs> we'll move on from instagram bar down 97 says i have a jack Hughes young gun i won for 45 dollars canadian should i hold or sell well okay first question is how do you win a card but then have to pay for i it? will tell you the how because eBay did the greatest, greatest, oh, eBay. they did the greatest marketing ever by they, they've been doing this since the day they started. You won whatever item you got, you won it. And they put that in your mind that you win. And it's, even though you paid money, you won, you won the auction, right? You were bidding against other people and you won. So that's why. Well, for Bardown, I agree though, that. 45 Canadian for Jack Hughes Young Gun is a W. What I would do is if if it looks like it could be a gem mint, I'd probably send it in for grading, probably PSA. If you need the cash now, it's a good time to sell. He's playing well. He was just in our Who's Hot segment, I believe, last episode. If you can hold, he looks like he could have superstar potential. We just talked about who are the three most likely candidates to get to that next level. And he's, I think, definitely one of them. So for what you have into it, if you can, I'd probably hold. Anything to add there, Troy? No, exactly what you said. So this next question is from Instagram. This is an amazing name. I just got to give the dude I just props saw it. or yes. gal. Yes, they need props. Lord Stanley and friends. I love it. We know Gretzky. We know what Gretzky cards are worth. What about Mario number 66 rookies? Okay, Troy. Well, before you say that, as I say, again, kudos to an awesome name, Lord Stanley and friends. If you look at our... Show description on your podcast app. There's a link to Card Ladder, and you can support the show. Sign up for them and look up complete sales history of every Mario Lemieux card you could ever imagine. So, little hint there. But Troy, you you did look up some Lemieux values. I did. I really liked this question because besides Mount Rushmore, when we brought up Lemieux, we really don't 
talk about him a lot. It's always Wayne, Wayne, He doesn't Wayne. get talked about a lot. No, it's always Wayne, but... It's always Wayne. It, but so it, everything's got to be Wayne, Troy. There, it's, there's a reason it's always Wayne, obviously. No, sure. We don't need to get the debate between who's the greatest hockey player ever, but I think it's awesome that someone asked about Mario Lemieux. Super Mario, as Josh likes to refer to him as. So just to give yes. you a little idea of his values, his rookie card is the 1985... OPG, it's a PSA 10, has a pop of 48. Its last sale via Heritage Auctions was for $45,600 on October 1st of this year. So there, we'll start with that, the high value one. And just to give you an idea, there's also some sales of the 85 tops version of this card. The PSA 10 has a pop of 78. Its last sale was via PWCC for $13,200 on November 27th of this year. So a couple days ago. And just to give you a little more idea, the 85 OPG and a PSA nine has a pop of six nineteen. It's last sale via eBay was $2,681 and 99 cents on November 17th, 2022. Reading that out loud. I obviously the pop's low, but man, that price seems low too. Does that seem low to you for PSA nine of arguably the second or third greatest player ever? 2000, 2,500 bucks. We'll say. Not a ridiculous pop either. No. No, that's a good buy. I would give somebody a W for that one. Okay, good answer, Troy. Next one, one of our frequent contributors, another one of our favorite names. Gosh, so much name creativity. Top Shelf Cookie Sniper 88 from Instagram. This was a fun one. I have a bone to pick with you on this one. A couple <laughs> bones to pick with you. So you're going first. If you're the GM of a new hockey team and can draft any player from 2020 to 2022, Rookie classes, so that gives you three years to choose from. Who are your starting six? I have three bones to pick with you. So I want you just to I want you to list your your roster and then let me tear it apart. All right. I put right wing Jason Robertson. I'm cheating and putting him on the off wing just so I can have him. Left wing Kirill Kaprizov. Yes. Yes. No man, I can make him go to the uh, off wing. Left wing is Kirill Kaprizov. My center is Zegras. Defense Cider. My other D is Lilligren. My goalie is Sorokin, and I actually added a seventh guy because I said I need an enforcer to pre- protect all these guys. And the biggest enforcer of the 2020-2022 in those years rookie class I could find was Jeffrey Veal, who has a lot of fights on HockeyFights.com. <laughs> so that's why I put him in there. I need my enforcer to protect my team. Okay, I'm scratching that off. <laughs> that doesn't count. You're just such a Jason Robertson fanboy <laughs> since our conversation that you had to... Put him in there so I can live with that. How in God's green earth do you defend putting Sorokin ahead of Otten? I have I talked myself into Sorokin just because I think with my team now, I have the absolute most technical, elite, best goalie. He's going to be in the perfect situation. We're running to the cup. Obviously, I have PC Ottinger. However, I think Sorokin will lead this team to the cup before Ottinger would. I'm speechless. So in, in this... In episode 36 of the Hockey Cards Gone Show <laughs> podcast, you've not only dumped all over our <laughs> beloved Kirill Kaprizov, your guy who you literally never shut up about, Jake Ottinger, you've now sent to the back. Would he be your backup? Or, I mean, he'd be my backup. Or you, maybe he becomes a starter. I'm not saying Ottinger is terrible. I love Ottinger. I PC him. I, I just said in this situation, I'm going Sorokin. Wow. They would call you a turncoat. Back in the 1700s, yeah. right? You can't, you can't say Good I uh, play favorites, that. I guess. Okay, so you had Robertson, which is like cheating. Because <laughs> he's not a he's a left wing, not a right wing. But well, he came to me, he's come to me with his concerns. He would like to play the off wing. You have Kaprizov, Zegras, Mosider, Lilligren, and Sorokin. So I actually am a man of honor <laughs> and truthfulness. I picked a right wing, so I went with Lucas Raymond. I don't cheat. Like you, I picked our guy, Kirill, Dollar Bill Kirill, y'all, for the left wing. Was right in lockstep with you at the center position in Trevor Zegers. I don't know about that one, though. I wonder if two years from now. He's just, like, so slight and flashy. and Yeah. My team yeah. needs that, though. I, I like that in my players. Then I was just like you. I took our guy, Mo Sider, who's a little bit of a tougher pick of this year. But I still think he has the most upside. I went with Sean Jersey. I think this is a guy we need to start talking about. Yeah, I, I, I you saw, looked up his I stats? saw your list. I looked him up real quick just while you're talking. Clueless. Like, I, it's just some guy. I mean, I, I know who he is. Obviously, I just never really studied him. Well, he's on a team that win, like loses games but scores eight goals. So, And then 
I have no affiliation to Jake Ottinger. I'm not <laughs> Jake Ottinger's biggest fan. I'm not a world-renowned goalie coach that does nothing but sing the praises of Jake Ottinger, but yet I pick him to be the goalie of my team. So, Jake, if you're listening, <laughs> you know who's got your back. It ain't Troy. At the slightest bit that he thinks he can improve the team, he's going to throw <laughs> I'm sticking with you, bud. So, again, it was a fun exercise. One guy I do want to mention, I'm just curious because I had to think really hard about and again, we're looking at players from the 2020 to 2022 rookie class. How hard was it to, for you to leave Cole Caulfield off this list? I, I had him in my original. But then I was just like, mm. I, I went back and forth, back and forth. I finally removed him. But yeah, he was definitely definitely in my discussion. Yeah, it was tough for me to leave him up the list. Okay, next question from Sports Cards Winter Haven via Instagram. This is a great question. I'm curious to get your response on this too. Why no love for numbered artifacts rookie cards in the hobby? Personally, I like the fact that they are numbered. Young Guns are not, and the artifacts sell for a fraction of the price. I know Young Guns are the establishment. Well, what I would say is you kind of answer yep, your own question that's exactly a little what I was bit. Say and, this, and this comes down to, and we say this again and again, but it's really true. There's three cards that consistently return value in the hockey card hobby. That doesn't mean that they're the best cards, the coolest cards, the awesomest cards to own. If you're looking from a value perspective, the safest money is on Young Guns, Future Watch Autos, and Cup RPA out of 99. That's just kind of the way it is. Yeah, I'm with him. I love artifacts. I actually liked artifacts or, or like artifacts, and I get what he's saying. But again, he, he does kind of answer his own question. It's just how, right now, how the hobby is. And that's the consensus or the popular opinion. And until that changes, it's going to be that. It's going to keep being that way. Last question this week is from Twitter. It's nice to get some Twitter contributions from John Ayafala. This is one that, Troy, we talked earlier and you went in a total rabbit hole. <laughs> I did. On, but it was kind of, I thought you got some great information. His question is, 2019 OPG Glossies. It's 2019 20 Dash 20, OPG glosses, glossies. How can you tell the difference between the gold and bronze variations? So I'm going to, again, shut up my mic and hand it over to Troy. Yeah, so basically I did some research. And again, it's one's a gold, one's a bronze. And actually, not to be that guy, but I actually found out it's actually called copper. So there's gold and copper variations. And the way to think about the difference is they do, once you see them side by side, you can tell the difference. The copper or the bronze in the question will always be a little darker and have almost a reddish brown tinge to it. So that's the, to me, that's the easiest way to tell. I did try to look at the the backs on the pictures and at the bottom right, there's an OPG like stamp or whatever. And some of some of the card pictures, it looked like it was a different color. Some didn't look like it was a different color, but so I would just use the front. If it's a lighter yellowish gold. I mean, you, you can tell once you see the pictures side by side, the bronze or the copper will always be like a, a rust color with a little red coming through. And then I went down the rabbit hole of finding these cards. They were actually, it looks like they were inserts in 2019, 20 um, upper deck series one. And I believe two, and they were only available in retail tins. And I can't remember the exact odds, but that's where, that's where they were. I think they had a standard version and then there was the gold and bronze variations. Okay, everybody, where else are you going to get an in-depth <laughs> breakdown of 2019-20 OBG glossies than the Hockey Cards Gong <laughs> Show podcast? We got you, people. Well, that is our show for this Thursday. If you liked this episode, and hopefully you did, please leave a rating and review on Apple, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you listen to us on. If you love the show and want to support us, want to see us do well, want to see us continue with the Gong Show and help produce better, more content, please consider being a patron. And joining our Patreon out of 99 support level tier, it's $5 a month. You can go to the Patreon website, search for Hockey Cards Gong Show Podcast, view the link in our by the link in our description or on our Instagram profile. There's a link to our link tree there. If you're not following us on social media, you're crazy. Do it now. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube. Troy, the Hockey Cards Gong Show Podcast is a production of Dollar Box Ventures, LLC. Have a great rest of the week. We'll see you all on Monday. <laughs>